We are ready to begin our sixth and final interview of the process to fill our district for vacancy. So welcome, Skyler. Um, we have 10 questions for you this evening, which um, we will kind of do round robin style. You will, um, I will be timekeeper and raise my hand at five minutes. I will not stop you, um, but if you see me raising my hand, that's just an indication of you're at five minutes for that particular question. Um, I think that's it. Yeah, most, if you, most candidates have been moving pretty quickly through the question, so. Yeah. You'll so don't feel pressured time. by time, yeah. Um, so if you'll just state your name before we get started, and then we'll dive right into the questions. Yes, thank you. My name is Skylar Newberry Mays. Hold on just a second, Skylar. There we go. Say that again for me. Skylar Mayberry Mays. Thank you. All right, Skylar, thanks for joining us today in this nice, beautiful day. Um, what motivated you to apply for the school board position? Yeah, thank you, Anna, for the question. Um, when I think about what motivated me to apply for the school board, there are actually a lot of reasons why I sit here before you today that have expressed my interest. But particularly this evening, I really want to focus on two specific reasons, and that translates to two specific names of people who have made a significant lasting impact in my life, although they're no longer here on this earth. One of them is, you know, this is a delicate dance in a very delicate time. And over the years, I have had the fortune to be mentored and to have role models in this community, one of them being Terry Caldwell Johnson. For several years, Terry has mentored me. Terry has helped me. I have learned from her. And Terry encouraged me to consider this, this journey. So that's one of the reasons. The second reason happened 10 years ago. Ten years ago, I was partnered and matched through the Big Brothers Big Sisters program with a young man by the name of Montrell. When I met Montrell in fifth grade at King Elementary School, he shared a few things with me. But one thing that I observed was that Montrell was vocal, he was charismatic, and he was intentional. But unfortunately, community labeled him as disruptive, challenging, and problematic. So the two reasons I'm here today to stand on the shoulders of Terry Caldwell Johnson and continue her legacy. And number two, to ensure that no one in this school district ever has the experience that Montrell had again, because he deserved to have his potential defended. And I, as well as this district, let that slip out of our hands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've been having technology problems. Sorry. All night. Thank so it's you. Kind of, we're getting a little feisty. Everybody's Apologize. hot right now. Everybody's Skylar. hot. Okay. Um, Skylar, what do you feel are the largest challenges facing our school district, and how would your appointment to the school board help the board in addressing these challenges? Yes. Thank you, Jenna, for the question. So I've identified what I think are three of the largest challenges facing the school district right now, while there are many others, but also to recognize that these challenges are not unique just to Des Moines Public Schools, but we're truly experiencing some challenges globally and throughout our nation. The first one is addressing the achievement gaps. It is no secret that there are certainly marginalized populations within this school district, and I'm specifically referring to our ELL students and our black males who are not achieving at the levels that they deserve to be achieving at. We have to put intentional efforts behind them, intentional resources and intentional support to ensure that we're closing the achievement gap so that they're, they're accomplishing the same levels of things that those around them are. The second challenge would be ensuring equitable access to resources. DMPS is really fortunate that there are so many resources available to our students. However, we also recognize that not all of these students know that all of these resources exist. And it's not just the students, but making sure that the parents also know that these resources exist because the parents ultimately are the ones making the decisions, but sometimes they're being informed by the students. And the third biggest challenge I see in this district is navigating the complexities of a diverse student population. Our student body is changing daily. Our student body looks at the day as they look at these chairs and they want representation as well. They want someone sitting at the seat that also has the lived experiences that they've had. They deserve to have black male representation that's not just the superintendent. They deserve to have representation 
They deserve it, they've earned it, and they need it. And until we as a district and we as a board are ready to challenge ourselves and do that and face this status quo, they're gonna continuously be underwhelmed, underserved, and under, excuse me, under-resourced. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Skyler, how do you plan to collaborate with other board members and the community members uh, to make informed decisions as a board member? Yeah, it's a great question, thank you. So there are a few ways that in which I plan to collaborate. <clears throat> And I would say the first step in that has been what I've taken over the past several weeks, and that's getting to know most of you. I think it's critical that in order to collaborate, you have to understand why someone sits in the space that they sit in. So as I sat with many of you and was able to have conversations about why you're on the school board, what drove your passion, what drove your interests, it helped me to understand that collaboration is possible because you have the same reasons for sitting there as I do. In addition to that, I think we have to make sure we have open communication channels. The communication, cha the communication channels can't simply be public forums and newspapers. Those times are outdated. We have to meet them where they are, and that may be things like social media. It may be things like articles and newspapers in different languages, but we have to meet our population of our students where they are in order to truly collaborate and bring them to the table. And lastly, it's making myself accessible and available. That means sitting outside of just these four walls. Now, while I recognize the importance of serving and sitting in this seat, I also recognize the importance of being engaged authentically and genuinely within this community. I've been very fortunate to work in community relations professionally, and I've learned many design tricks and expertise tricks about how do you convene and bring together populations that are oftentimes marginalized and overlooked. So when I think about collaboration, it's doing just that, meeting them where they are and convening populations that historically have not been invited to the table. Thanks, Skylar. Thank the next question is about the superintendent. Um, what do you see as a role, as the role of, this, of a school board member in holding the superintendent accountable for achieving the goals while honoring the guardrails? Absolutely, thank you, Madam Chair. So as it relates to the uh, responsibilities of accountability of the superintendent, I've had some time to familiarize myself with the student outcomes focused governance framework. And I recognize within that framework that the role of the school board member is simply to elevate the voice, the vision, and the values of the community and provide them as goals and guardrails, but truly allowing the superintendent to drive the vehicle to our destination. So when I think about accountability, there are a few areas that I'd like to focus on. One, as a school board, you must set clear expectations. It can't just be written down and it can't just be verbal, but it has to be a conversation that's robust and immersive. Second would be monitoring progress. I know that the school board currently monitors progress on an interim basis, but it's more than just looking at the numbers and saying, wow, we've dropped or wow, we've increased. It's asking the thoughtful questions, the questions that advance the conversation and move it forward to find and identify innovative solutions for the metrics that aren't being met. And lastly, it's continuous improvement and it's challenging that status quo. We as a district and as a school board have to challenge the status quo and we have to ask those thoughtful questions that make us think, what would the students say if they were sitting on this chair? What would the parents say if they were sitting in the audience? How do we hold a superintendent accountable by fostering a culture of continuous improvement and collaboration? There is a disconnect. No, there is no, no disconnect anymore. This is great. We were having challenges with our mic. Uh, I think Muchas gracias. Mande? <laughs> for the record. I think you were. I was having challenges. <laughs> <laughs> there is a disconnect within myself. <clears throat> um, how do you envision engaging with parents, students, and community stakeholders to ensure their voices are heard in the decision-making process? Yes, thank you, Maria. Um, when I think about being engaged with those populations, I go back to a comment I made earlier. It's about meeting them where they are. 
we have to actually meet these populations where they are. We can't afford and we can't rely on having a public forum in the evenings at 6.30 and expecting our everyday families to be able to show up and speak. It doesn't work for everyone. Meeting them, leveraging the expertise, the resources, and the broad networks of our community partners, whether those are nonprofits, businesses, educational institutions, or religious-based organizations, we have to show up in places that they are, and that's how we engage. We've tried for too long to invite them to the space. We've now got to get innovative in meeting them where they're at. Thanks, Skylar. Um, Question six is, can you provide an example of a difficult decision you've had to make in a leadership role and how you approached that decision? Thank you, Patrick. So I, the, the example that I'll offer is um, fairly recent. I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director of the Jacobson Institute at Grandview University. And while our scope is innovation in education, our mission has changed over the years. So our current mission is preparing, producing, and pivoting a future-ready workforce and we're doing this intentionally. When I joined into this role, there was a focus on global fluency and global populations. My approach to changing this was to go into the role and for the first 30 days to 60 days, simply to listen and to learn and to understand what the needs were and if the needs aligned with the mission and the focus of our institute. Well, I found out very quickly that the mission of our institute was probably more aligned with our local population. So the difficult decision was, while there were resources allocated to a global population and um, organizations to support that, our focus really needed to be more narrowly scoped here locally. I understand it may have frustrated certain parties. It may have caused some discourse and some tension. But at the end of the day, it helped a population, and it aligned with the sentiment of those, our stakeholders. The way in which I approached this was having that conversation after listening and learning, but also finding ways to educate and to get buy-in from those populations and show them that they too could help be advocates and sponsors of that work. Thank you. Okay, question number seven. Um, how do you plan to balance the needs and in interests of District 4 stakeholders while making decisions that are in the best interest of all students? Yes, great question, Anna. When I think about balancing the needs of District 4 with the broader DMPS district, uh, one thing comes to mind, and that's student-centered. We have to be student-centered. And sometimes that means that the priorities of your district may not be those most in need. We have to actually be student outcome focused. The beauty in all of this is that we continuously reevaluate what needs are needing to be met, what gaps are currently existing. So I may know that sometimes District 4's needs are not those that are being um, written down as the goals but that will continuously evaluate those and that the needs of District 4 will eventually be met or will be met because of that, that process. Um, the other thing I would offer is I recognize that there's a significant amount of diversity within these districts, particularly District 4. Beyond just the ethnic diversity, there's also the socioeconomic diversity that exists. And sometimes those can be competing priorities. But I'd be remiss to say that just because an, an issue exists within one district, doesn't mean that it's not an issue for the entire, the, the entire population. So I, I'll, I'll finish this thought by saying, I think both can exist. There can be needs of District 4 and needs of the district that coexist at the same time, and there's opportunities to create synergy and collaboration in advancing all of them. Thank you. Okay, so how will you ensure transparency and accountability in your role as a school board member? Thank you, Jenna. Well, I would, first, by defining transparency, I, I don't believe you can have transparency without having everyone's voice represented at the table. So for me, that is the key, is that we have all voices at the table. And the voices that cannot make it to the table, representation needs to be there and be willing to fight for those voices who are not at that table. 
But in order to invite them to the table, we have to be flexible and we have to be welcoming and foster that culture so that they feel comfortable enough being there. The other thing that I'll plan to do as far as accountability, which I've already done, is making sure that I'm present at all meetings. I've cleared my calendar for every school board meeting for the rest of this year. Not just showing up in person, but being present, doing my due diligence, being prepared to have engaging and thoughtful conversations as we sit around this table. Just block every Tuesday. <laughs> Sorry. They just keep adding on. So just every Tuesday. Through midnight. <laughs> till, till at least With 10 no o'clock. no food or water. No food. <laughs> Crackers only. It's not true, Skylar. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. No es cierto. Keeping it real. <laughs> We're I've fine. seen a Everything's few of you fine. eating snacks at the no. meetings. Oh. Uh, Skylar, can you share a time when you have challenged status quo? In your previous role, your current role, what was the situation? How did you approach it? And what was the outcome? Absolutely. Thank you for the question. So I'll lean on the experience as a volunteer in this community for this question. And uh, when I arrived to Des Moines, there was a program that I was involved with where um, volunteer members were doing volunteer service to prepare students to go to high school and then to go to college. And within this program, it wasn't new, but I was new to it. The program had been around since 1922, but I had just joined and started getting familiar. Here locally when it was being implemented, the program took place at a high school, and I understood that based off of the research and based off of many of the conversations, that in order to prepare students, prepare students for secondary education, you can't just start at the high school. So when I became the director of educational activities for this program, I was intentional about changing some of our focus. I moved that program solely from a high school and it already had good outcomes, but I moved it to a local middle school so that we could start sooner. I realized that that, that program was specifically focused on preparing students for college readiness, but I changed the pivot to career readiness. It was more than just going to college, and it was more than just being prepared in high school. I really wanted to align my vision with the data that supported it, starting earlier and realizing that not everyone has an interest or a desire to go to college. To answer your question about the outcome, the outcome can be viewed in this community. The outcome is business professionals, HVAC technicians, college graduates, and loving parents. Question. Can I ask a follow-up question? Can you ask a follow-up question? I can think I? Can. Yes, I think. What is your thought about goal three? Our goal three. I you tell them. Give them, give them a little readiness. context. I would, I would know it I, yeah. the Career readiness. Career readiness. Well, I, I think you appreciate the layup. So, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I have a lot of thoughts around career readiness. As um, several of you are probably familiar just from maybe my resume or maybe on, in conversation, I decided to make a difficult decision three months ago after spending over a decade in corporate America, doing really well at it and actually enjoying it. I decided to align my career with my heart and with my passion, and I made the pivot and moved into higher education. But I'm not in the traditional sense of higher education that most think. While, I'm, while I am an administrator at a university, my focus is specifically on a future-ready workforce. Although I am the, benefit, the beneficiary of going to college, I have family members, I have friends, and I have mentees that have also benefited from solid career choices. So my thoughts around goal number three, I think it's brilliant that we're focused on more than just going to college because all students don't have an interest in that and all students deserve access to resources to prepare them for life after high school. Gracias, brillante, brilliant. <laughs> De nada. So, Skylar, you were so good with your time. It's 720. Uh, and so this is your time to ask us questions. We've got about probably 30 minutes, a little bit less um, than that for questions. Thank you so much. Um, first, I'll yield to see if there are any additional follow-up questions, and then I will have some as well. So I think we're trying to refrain from asking questions of the candidates so we stay on script. Perfect. It's good to have framework. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So what I will share, you know, I have 
as mentioned, I've done my due diligence over the past several weeks to understand why all of you are sitting in these seats, but also understand what motivates you about school board, what motivates you about our community. So although I don't have any final questions, I do have a final why that I'd be willing and interested in sharing. And this final why dates back 17 years ago. As a high school senior in a public school system, three weeks before graduating high school, all throughout high school, I had worked at a local grocery store, and my vision of success was to continue working at that grocery store and one day become the assistant manager. It was programs in our communities like IJAG and Avenue Scholars and Alpha Phi Alpha and investing in my future, big brothers, big sisters, that defended my potential. I had a specialist in my class by the name of Ms. Bragg. And what Ms. Bragg said to me three weeks before graduating high school was, what are your plans after high school? I said, Ms. Bragg, I'm going to go be the assistant manager at the local hy V." She never talked negatively upon that. But what she did was provided resources and alternatives. Ms. Bragg encouraged me to take the ASVAB and the ACT. But she took it a step further. She found a way to have it paid for so that I could take it. I took the ACT and the ASVAB, not because I wanted to, but because Ms. Bragg looked like me and she had me in her best interests. I took the ACT and I scored a 16. At that time, that was foreign to me. I had no idea what a 16 meant in the grand scheme of things. But I called Ms. Bragg immediately and I shared, I took the ACT and I scored a 16. Her response was quick. Are you okay with me sharing this with the class? The very next day I got to my high school classroom, there were balloons, there were streamers, and there was a cake that said congratulations. Miss Bragg celebrated the fact that I did something that was different. Miss Bragg then started thinking quickly. She said, we've got to get you moving. Do you have an interest in college? A very foreign concept at the time as a first generation college student and graduate. It wasn't something I had considered. Ms. Bragg set me up with an internship program for one week with her State Farm agent. Ms. Bragg helped me identify a major of finance and real estate because she observed my passion in the game Monopoly. Five years later, sight unseen, I walked across the stage at the University of Northern Iowa with dual degrees in finance and real estate. So my why is simple. The Terry Caldwell Johnsons, the Montrells, and the Miss Braggs. All students in Des Moines Public Schools deserve to have a Miss Bragg in their life. And I'm grateful that I had her, and I will continue to fight until hell freezes over, and then I will fight on the ice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Skylar. Thanks, Skylar. Thank you, Skylar. Thank you. Gracias. So, that was wonderful. Do you have any other questions you want to ask us? I do not. OK, Thank great. you. Thank right. you. Thanks for coming. Thanks to the fan club. There will be pretzels back here if anybody would like some. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Skylar. Do you want to say something? All right. That concludes our um, sixth and final interview of candidates to fill the District 4 vacancy. Board members, um, please take time to compile your scale scores and enter them into the um, document that I sent to each of you. Um, and we will begin our, our next session promptly at 8 p.m., our next special meeting promptly at 8 p.m. to discuss uh, the results of the interviews and decide which applicant and um, will be our district four board member. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Is that a no, it's not. No. If you'd like to go get your popcorn, Jackie. Yep. Come on. <laughs> we'll be here. It'll be streamed too. So we'll be here yeah. and it will be streamed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 8 p.m. <laughs> thank you. And, and thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you for I coming. Very grateful to see all of your beautiful faces here. Thank you. Thank you.